evening we are going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 34, and, uh, but uh, we'll not be reading all of, of the verses that are there, and uh, we'll be looking at the life of Josiah. Now, it was a sermon that I gave to the uh, secondary chapel this past week. It is not the same sermon. I've, I have to change the, uh, the uh, focus, but the, an underlying theme still remains the same in it. So uh, let's turn in your scriptures to Jeremiah, or excuse me, Second Chronicles chapter 33 this evening. Um, and while you're turning there, allow me to just to make mention of when you come to an evening service, there are, it gets a little bit thin t- toward the evening, and there are some that are very regular. Jim and Trantha, uh, Jim and Teresa uh, Trantham typically are here this evening, and all of the Sunday evenings. Now, the only reason Jim would not be here with Teresa is because he's probably not doing well. So uh, just to make a, a note of that, to, to continue to keep him in prayer, as you know, He's uh, up there in years, and he's um, on different kind of medications. Uh, so these are the these are times when, by a little bit of of stress, can bring an individual down. So remember them also, Elizabeth. Uh, remember her health and her strength. And as John mentioned, uh, the seniors is there on their trip. We want to continue uh, to keep them before the throne of grace, that God would give them a great time and safety while they are are out. All right, Jeremiah, or excuse me, boy, I don't, let's hope we don't get into Jeremiah tonight, or we're going to have the kings and prophets all upside down, and you'll wonder if you want to keep me for another one year, let alone 15. Beginning at verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, uh, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of the, David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and from the groves and from the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and its images that were on high above them, and he cut down and the groves and the card images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strewed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed onto them. Now let's close there and open up with prayer. Once again, Father, we have been invited to participate in the scriptures. And it is uh, by your grace, by your mercy and your kindness that you continue daily to share your heart with us by this uh, inspired word. Now, as the word, the scripture would teach us, that it is an engrafted word that is, uh, finds its place in our hearts, and might it now do that work of producing fruit on the righteousness. Help us as we look at this very young, yet very um, uh, um, healthy and very spiritually strong uh, king, one of the few that would reign over Judah, and learn from him things that can apply to our lives to in the days in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I give it the title, Straight on Christianity, because you'll see there at the end of verse 2, and he declined neither to the right hand nor to the left, indicating to us that this was a man that was going to move straight forward in his life. So when we give you a little bit of a background of what we have, we have uh, his grandfather was King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a, a godly king. And uh, in his life and in his ministry, he did much for Judah. He, he brought them up, held a, uh, a, a high standard of godliness and holiness for the kingdom, for the throne, and even brought it upon the people. Now, as with seems to be with most all of these kings, he had his bad days, and toward the end of his life, uh, we would read that there was kind of a, a falling off. But nevertheless, he still maintained his, pretty much all of his spiritual integrity. He worked closely with Isaiah during those days, and if you read in the book of Kings, you'll notice that he and, and uh, Isaiah shared prayer meetings with the threat of Sennacherib from the uh, Syrians. Josiah's grandfather was Manasseh. We read about his life. And uh, Manasseh reigned for 55 years. 
Manasseh was an evil king, and you pick up uh, prior to that in, ver in chapter 33. But what is unique about King Manasseh's life is that he, in one sense, he satisfied all the things that evil kings would do. And God, in this unique situation, specifically singled him out that he would go to prison by a foreign army, and he did. But during that time, while he was in prison, we read in chapter 33 and verse 11 and 12, that wherefore the Lord brought upon him the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took him an ass among the thorns, bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication. And God brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. And Manasseh knew that the Lord was his God. Now, during the remaining years of King Manasseh's life, he would try in, uh, in as best that he could, with the limited time that he had, to bring about a revival to the land of Judah. It somewhat failed, but nevertheless, he still remained true. He's one of those rare situations, along with one other king, whereby God would hear the prayers of a repentant man and restore him to his place, or even to spare his life. Now, what is that in, uh, of interest to us, because his, uh, Manasseh's father was that of Ammon. And Ammon, we read about him in verse 21 of chapter 33, when he was two and 20 years old, when he began to reign, and he only reigned for two years. He had a very short time in which to live. He was also an evil king. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father did. Now, I want you to notice uh, that, he, that in this verse, the, the writer points out that he was evil in the sight of the Lord, as was his father, for Ammon sacrificed on the carnage images which Manasseh, his father, had made and served them. So he's guilty of bringing uh, Judah into uh, the practice of idolatry, but yet, and yet he humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. Between that chapter and chapter 34 and chapter 35, there are more sermon points and devotional points than a por porcupine has quills. But at the same time, what we want to do this evening is just highlight the, the things of interest to us. When we get to chapter 34, we find that Josiah is eight years old. Now, his dad uh, only reigned for two years. So while at age eight, he would only see two years of his dad on the, on the throne at ages six and seven. Prior to that, as a very, very young child, he would have actually been able to witness or at least know something of the works of his grandfather Manasseh. Now, so Josiah then has a background that has uh, of mixed caliber, mixed qualities. Uh, he would see repentance. He would see idolatry. He, he would see a, uh, a man that, that was, or at least hear about him, incorrigible. That would be Manasseh because it would require hooks and rings to drag him out. The, the figurative language there that he was like an animal that had to be uh, put through the nose and pulled along. And so these things being recorded and passed on, Josiah would have heard about his grandfather, then we'd have, they would have learned something, and actually probably knew uh, immediately of the assassination of his father, uh, Ammon, who was later assassinated at the end of his second year. So Josiah doesn't come from a, necessarily from a godly heritage. And that's of interest to us because when we, when we read about him in these first three verses, you, you think that he, was, he came from uh, a high-profile Bible college and a university and very, uh, very faithful uh, teaching parents, but he didn't. He comes from a mixed background. He saw both the evil and the good, and he saw God at work, and he saw men rebelling against God. So that's why we pay particular attention to Josiah here this evening. And in terms of an outline, um, let, me, let me give you a little bit of teaching here. 
when you first read about something like this, if you're doing a study, uh, you don't have to preach everything that you study, but for your own heart, you would look at this text, and as you read chapter 34 and 35, um, you might come out with an outline that would sound something like this, the priority of Josiah. And then the second point would be the passion of Josiah. The third point would be the piety of Josiah. Fourth point, we could say the perseverance of Josiah. And then the fifth one is, would be the pride of Josiah. But that's all third person. Third person sermons don't carry a lot of weight. We want to just put all the responsibility on the character and, and have less opportunity to make an application to our own heart. So I, I simply, uh, first off, in a proper study, is you'll, you create your outline based on the characters and what you see. Uh, but then when it comes to making the point to your own heart and application for the congregation, I would arrange it in these terms. And that would be this. Number one, we would make God the priority of our life. We would make restitution, restoration, the passion of our life. And we would let piety then be the, the uh, practice of our life. And then next Sunday evening, we'll look at, and I'll rephrase it, his perseverance and his pride. But for tonight, let's take a look at these three. And, uh, and, and allow uh, the scriptures to seek. So we have a model, we have an example. And we don't want to necessarily just focus on the example, but we want to draw down from what we see in his life and how that can uh, enrich our spiritual lives so that we can have maintain such a quality of a spirituality and a passion and a priority and a perseverance that Josiah had as uh, the scriptures are very careful to give to us this chronology and this narrative of, of such a fine king. By the way, just to give you some uh, reference as to what kind of a king was he, you, would, you might want to go to chapter 35 and in verse 18. It was in the final days. Now, he only reigned for uh, approximately 18 years, um, and um, then that was it. It was a short-lived kingdom, but notice verse 18. And there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. Now, that's, that's saying a lot. And the kings, the priests, and the Levites, and the Judah, all that were present in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And it was in the 18th year that the, that the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. He's actually, when you do the math, he was age 26. And at age 26, he conducts a Passover that is carefully recorded in the Scripture that there was nothing like it. And nothing like it, and yet when you look at the history that brings up to this, you see Israel rising and falling, Judah having good kings, and then kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord. So this, this is an excellent text of Scripture. It has immediate bearing on young people and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the up-and-coming generation, the elementary students, the high school students, college students. It also has great effect and message to us even though we, most of us here are somewhere at, at age 30 plus years. So let's look at the, the first one, and that would be this. Oh, I'm sorry, I already advanced that. Make God the priority of your life. When we talk about that, if we look at Josiah, and we notice that the, one of the priorities was the first is he established biblical habits. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, simply meaning that he obeyed the Scripture. He obeyed what he understood that was taught from him from the, from the, the book of Moses, the law of God. He probably obeyed that which the, the local prophets, which God had them in the, in the political arena of the, of the kingdom. And so he, he is a man that he knew what to do, and he was committed to it. So he established early in his life biblical habits, biblical patterns, and he had historical models to follow because we read, and he, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and, and walked in the ways of David his father. Now, David his father goes way back a long time, but yet he lifted him up out of the pages of history, knowing, telling us 
that if he's going to walk in the ways of David his father, he was reading the history books. Whoever was writing this down, he had copies of it, and he put it in his heart, that is the kind of man that I want to be. Let me ask you, let me give you this challenge. Who is it in your life of either biblical characters or characters that have so exemplified the faith of the scriptures and Christianity that you can look at them and say, I want to be like that person. We need those kind of people. And you can find them in your local church, but let me tell you, you can read about them in books. Great missionary stories, even military books, which I'm fond of. You, you pick up uh, such biblical uh, models to follow. Some of what I read are not necessarily Christian, but yet the examples that they set forth that are endorsed by the Word of God. And so here is a man that we could just say, uh, at least two things immediately in the historical biblical model to follow. Number one would be that he read his history, and secondly would, would be that, that he chose that one that best exemplified what Jehovah expected an, an Israelite and how he's supposed to live. And so he wasn't just a reader for the sake of gathering knowledge, he was a reader for the sake of gathering knowledge. Uh, and that which was instrumental in changing his life. Thirdly, he started early in life, at age eight. Now, it was not uncommon for men to start at such a young age. There are several kings that we are told, for example, Manasseh, in chapter 33, he was only 12 years old when he came to the throne. And these men would be entered in because they were part of the, uh, the kingly lineage, and um, if their dad was assassinated, which some of these kings were just taken out of the picture, they would be the next in line. And they were given that place. That was carefully guarded. But so he would, he would have mentors around him. And these mentors would make or break the next generation of leadership for the nation. In this case... He, he followed the advice of his teachers and his instructors and the, and the prophet, but he started early in life. Now, okay, age eight. Now, I can't even remember where I was at at age eight. But one thing's for sure. He did not wait until he was age 12. He didn't wait until he was 18. Or nowadays, as I explain to the young people, uh, there was a time when there were no teenagers, there was a time when the teenage never existed. So that when a young man uh, in Rome, in the first one to two hundred years of Rome, he, at, at somewhere around the age 12 to 14, there was a ceremony by, by his dad and his parents, and then as many friends and relatives would, would take a walk down through the city, and they would come to the center of the city or the, at the judgment seat, and at that point, it, what was given to him was a white robe, a toga that was put around him. He was officially declared to be a Roman citizen at that time, and he would be given adult responsibilities. He was uh, looked upon as as a, an adult. Uh, the girls didn't have that kind of ceremonial service, but uh, their mothers would take them when, they, when uh, she was of an age, about the same age, the mom would take her to the temple of Artemis, and there she would surrender all of her Barbie dolls. And all those childhood things, she would give them over, and then she would be declared of entering into womanhood. And sometimes it meant marriage, certainly a few years after that. So we have, as a nation, back in the 30s and the 40s, we've done a great discredit to that period of time from what uh, James Dobson calls adolescence of 9, 10, 11, and 12, and then they get into 13 up through it, what used to be 19, as long as it ended in teen, there was teenager, but now it is pushed up to age 25. Young people don't come out of teenage years until suddenly one day they they kind of like just wake up and, oh, I guess I am an adult. And the problem with that is there is this delay in becoming mature, delay in becoming responsible, delay in becoming de dedicated and committed to any cause. And Josiah indicates to us because he didn't have a label stuck on him that you're just an adolescent, or you can't do anything else, he entered into the scene uh, assuming the responsibility and knowing that he was going to be an adult. 
And I would say to all of us here in this auditorium, just in terms of do not delay, be committed, make God the priority of your life, no matter at what stage of life it actually is. Because you'll also notice at age 16, in the 12th year, we're told in our text that he did, uh, he sought in verse 3, that he began to seek after the God of David, his father. Whatever he was being taught turned his heart toward seeking after God. So not only did he walk according to the ways of his father, David, but he now would also seek after God as he had. So two highlights of David in this man's life. He was a man that was obedient, and it was a man that was hungry and had a passion to, to know God as in his heart. And from that, then we, we reach this little point number one of making God the priority of our, of our lives. And the final lesson of it is don't wait. Start immediately. Wherever you're at in life, the text just indicates to us that early is the best. And he sees whatever opportunities and whatever means and methods he possibly could in order to grow in that direction. Secondly, we make restoration the passion of your life. When we read from verse uh, in chapter 34, when we pick up our reading at verse 4 and onward, especially up through verse 7, here in, in these verses you read these, this uh, redundancy of destroying, of smashing, of burning, and uh, destruction, and it has to do with the images and uh, the high places and uh, all, those, all those things that would uh, rob uh, the hearts of the people from worshiping God and, and their hearts are turned toward idols. And so I, I'll read verse 4, which I did, a breaking down of the images, and then uh, he would cut down, and then he took those carved images, and he broke those, those pieces, and uh, he would make dust. And interestingly enough, it is a here in your face to those priests, he would cast it all onto the graves of them that had sacrificed onto them. And then he would burn later on the bones of the priest and scatter their ashes. He, in other words, he was just creating the great insult to the pagan gods. What's in it for us? What's in it for us is that in his passion of pleasing God, in his passion to want to walk in the ways and uh, to seek after God, he realized that these were not two separate events in an individual's life. That the follow-through, what comes naturally after seeking after God and, and walking in the ways of God is, is if there are things that are do idols in my life, I have to take radical measures to make sure that they are thoroughly destroyed. You go to Ephesians chapter 4, that uh, we are to put on the new man which was created after God and, and righteousness and holiness and put, on, put off the old man which is co corrupt according to its deceitful ways. And Josiah just gives to us an example, a living illustration of what it is to put off and to put on. We are, if you're saved and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have been created in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, put on that which is consistent with the new character, the new creation that God has instituted in your life. But at the same time, it is necessary that some of the old baggage that we uh, have and bring with us into Christianity, those old practices, and even some current practices that we have that are distractions need to be dealt with, and they need to be dealt with radically. This man, he went, in other words, today we were looking at, isn't that a little bit overboard, Josiah? Come on, just... Take a chainsaw and cut the trees down. Let's just walk away. No, he's got to smash, burn, crush, dust, take, dig up bones of priests and burn them. In other words, this guy went over the edge in some minds, but he understood that there could not be one trace of idolatry that would remain if the people of Judah were going to turn their hearts back to God. You know, it stands stark comparison to his grandfather Manasseh. 
Remember, his grandfather Manasseh was already a, a, a very disobedient, done evil in the sight of the Lord kind of a king and ignored the words of the prophets. So God would have to transport him into an Assyrian prison. During that time, he gets his heart right with God and God restores him back to his kingship. But I want you to notice something in chapter 33 and, and verse 17. 16 and 17, and he repaired. Now we're talking about King Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, and he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings. And notice this, and he commanded, uh, I just lost my place, and commanded Judah to serve the, the Lord God of Israel. Now, let me just say something right here. You cannot legislate holiness. Does that make sense? You can command all you want. And I want you to notice the way that the res people responded to this command. Here, this is the difference between Manasseh and Josiah. Jo Manasseh had already built all of these groves. He built these altars. He probably had contractors that went out and did all of it. He repents. God brings him back. And we find that in, in verse uh, 16, he makes the, ta the repair of the temple. He commands Judah to serve uh, the Lord God of Israel. And then one word, verse 17, nevertheless. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet only at, unto the Lord their God only. Let that just settle in for a moment. What's that look like? It's called half-hearted devotion. Okay, king, we get it. You want us to serve the Lord your God. We're going to do that. But rather than having designated places established uh, as, as king for Judah, for Jehovah, and by the, the local priest or the, the itinerant prophet, we'll go to the high places, but only at these high places. Rather than worshiping God, uh, the, the idol will worship God. And I think the terminology there, nevertheless indicates to us that here is this half-hearted worship. They had the place of the pagan, but they brought in the worship toward God. Now, folks, let me tell you, it's never going to work. It didn't work here. And that's probably part of the reason why his son, Ammon, proved to be a, a disastrous failure, maybe even to the extent that a hit was put out on him and they took his life after two years. But when we look at King Josiah, he, he didn't command the people. He just did it. He destroyed it. You're not going to have anything left. And during that period of time, we find this radical destruction. Matthew, Jesus would teach the people that in, in terms of um, uh, guarding your hearts against uh, the, the power and the strength of, of immorality. He said, if your eye offends thee, pluck it out. If your right hand uh, offends thee, cut it off. Please don't do that. But you get the picture. And in the picture is something serious has to be done because of the nature of the problem. Here is a situation where he took these serious measures because of the nature of the problem. Idolatry cannot be entertained, not in the smallest, not in one iota. There we have any likings or the smell of it or the looks of it or where it used to be. Everything has to be eliminated because he knew that this was a serious situation. The nation eventually would fall to failure and be shipped out as a result of idolatrous practices. And knowing that, he would not give any opportunity for a regrowth of idolatry in the land. So he took radical destruction. He restored the, the uh, making the application here, restore our body temple. Notice what he tells us in verse 7 and 8 of chapter 30, 34. We get to, to ver, and, and verse 7, and we have broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout the land. He returned to Jerusalem. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, after he had purged the land, we go to the bottom of that verse to repair the house of the Lord his God. So he's out. We have, it's just kind of like get a picture of what is happening here. Now, he's at age 26. You could do the math on your own time. And in his 18th year, 
So 18 years have elapsed for this king. And how long did he reign? He only reigned for 31 years. So halfway through, I want you to notice that the passion continues. And as the passion continues, he spends from the 12th year of his reign, as he begins to purge Judah of the, all the idolatry in verse 3, up through the 8th. So for six years, a six-year mission of bringing about the destruction of all the known places where idolatry would still take place, he goes back to Jerusalem. You see, the problem wasn't necessarily in Jerusalem. The problem was in the extremities of the nation. It was in the highlands. It was in the valleys. It was in those areas where nobody would even really think about it. But he understood that the, the spiritual maturity and the level of love and, and, and relationship A safe place to live. Does Jesus have that position where he is recognized as king? That's what matters. And so now we find that he comes back and he makes repairs. What is it about repairs is simply he's going to walk around and, and the, 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 literally in that day, uh, so many, so many kings like uh, they're kind of like the first ladies of the White House. All right. Uh, we're going to remodel this. We're going to change all the colors. I want all these pictures down. I want all my flowers up. Here are my favorite characters of life. And so this probably was taking place in the temple. Not to mention the fact that there, the Levites had already slipped off to the side. And um, th there had to be a revival just within the Levite community itself. But he saw that there was need uh, that the house of God, the temple of God, the temple that Solomon built that he wanted to restore it to his beauty. And we're, we're just at the second dimension of the man's life. The Passover keeping was the pinnacle. That was the, the, uh, the, the highlight of the spiritual core of the, of the nation and of the king himself. But he comes back to restore, to rebuild the temple. So in our lives, if we talk about making restoration, the passion of our life does not necessarily have, I'm going to start today and end X years from now. It was a continuation. And, and how here is a man after six years of uh, doing this radical destruction, he enters into the project of rest restoration. And, we've, and as this progresses, we jump rapidly over to uh, verse 17. And when they gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and delivered it onto the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen, then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now, it almost sounds as if this is a strange piece of work. And it, and it very well could have been that way because, remember, Manasseh, not the best, his grandfather, his dad, Ammon, 
dies two years, they assassinate him, and he did evil. So a lot of this stuff was hidden, full of dust balls. And it came to pass, in verse 19, when the king heard the words of the law, that he tore his clothes. That is a visible expression of being, um, uh, what's the wording that I want here? In despair. He was grieved, uh, agonizing over, probably like this, all of this time, and now you bring me the book? All of this time, and how have we been living? And, you, and as your king, your duty, your responsibility, uh, Shaphan was to bring me the book at my early days and allow me to read it so that I could learn it, I could write it, and, and I could know it annually. And I think at this point in time, he realizes that if it's been hidden from him and, and from the cabinet, it's been hidden from the people. And he understands the nature, the, the problem that is there. And so he immediately engages in the renewing of his mind with the word of God. As he tore his clothes, the king commanded the priest and, uh, and his lineage behind him saying, verse 21, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah. I want you to notice something. Now, remember, we have a divided kingdom. We have Judah and we have Israel. There are two of the tribes that, that constitute uh, the Judah, and there are ten that constitute Israel. This man's heart was so dedicated to what that law had to say that he knew that when it was originally written, the authors had in mind all twelve tribes. And so now as he's reading it, he said, this is not just for us. There are the other ten. And so he commands uh, Hilkiah the priest and, and his associates, inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words in this book. What's up? But I, he understands that be, the, the words of the book that are there, I suspect that the priest and the prophet brought to him the words, probably, maybe, from the end of Deuteronomy, that if you turn toward idols, if you turn away from me, here are the curses. Perhaps read something and was given to him, maybe what King Solomon had to say, that if my people who are called by thy name should uh, turn and repent, that if they would be a people that would uh, forfeit God, that there were dire consequences that would take place. And he's reading what is there. Now, that is not too much of guesswork. Let's go to the third point because I do want to bring this to close. I told you there were more points than a porcupine. But let piety be the practice of your life. And we're going to come back to a bit of this passage. What we find is found in verses 18 to 27, which we've already read up through, up through verse 21. So, um, the book is delivered, and it comes to a prophetess in verse 22. And they spake to her to that effect. Here's the king gave us a book. We want to give it to you. Will you give us an interpretation? Verse 23, and she answered them and said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. You tell the man that sent you to me. Tell him this. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place. That's why we know to, uh, pretty strongly that what he was reading was about uh, the evil that God was going to bring upon the people. Now, that's important for later on. But what she says, that the inhabitants thereof, even all of the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. So there you are. We now we know that it was came out of Deuteronomy, probably like 30 to 33, somewhere in that vicinity. Because they have forsaken me, because they have burned incense on the other gods, that they may provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so you shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which ye have heard. 
because thy heart was tender and you did humble yourself before God when you heard the words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and you humbled yourself before me and you did rend your clothes and weep before me, I have heard thee also, saith the Lord, and I will gather you with your fathers and you shall be gathered to the graves in peace. Neither shall your eyes see the evil which I shall bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. Little side thought, you got to be impressed with this prophetess. And she says, you, here's what you got to tell the king. Notice what she didn't say. King, you got it together, man. You're, you're doing great. I want you to keep what you're doing. And she did not reinterpret what was said. King, we saw all that you did for the past six years in eliminating all of the, uh, the pagan, the, 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 uh, the, the groves of Baal. God is going to forgive you. All things are going to go well. What begins well ends well. And you began well. You're not like your forefathers. You've stayed with David. Rather what she does, she gives a proper biblical interpretation of the text. You tell the king this. The land has sinned against me. The people sinned against me because of and provoke me to anger, verse 23, because of the works of their hand. Therefore, my wrath shall be uh, upon this place. Everything that was stated that they should not do, and if they did do it, found in Deuteronomy, the closing chapters given between the two mountains by Moses, the, the blessings and the curse, everything that was a part of the curse, they did. And it was over the limit. God was not going to recant. God was not going to draw back his wrath. And so that's the message that she has to give to the king. Can we pause there for a moment? I know the times in which we live, and so do you. We know that it is not going to get any better. We know that uh, the, all the issues that we hear in politics and in Washington, D.C., and the shift that has taken place from rather being a representative form of government as a judicial form of government. We know that, uh, that there is a day coming when, the, when we as a church, we will be at risk for even preaching the word. There are so many things that it is destined to be that way because the Bible said that in the last days there will be, and we are seeing everything that the Bible said would be. Do we give up? Do we stop? We know it's going to end in fatal destruction, that there is a limited amount of hope. But yet this king, he knew that. He was told that. He read that. And we are told that that brought him to humility and repentance. And he says, when you heard the words against this place, and you humbled yourself, and you rend your clothes before me, and wept before me, I have heard thee also saith the Lord. You drop down to verse 31. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies. You know there's another option to that. Why fight? Why continue? We're on a dead-end street. It's never going to get any better. What is the, what is the purpose of, of just keeping on? That was not Josiah. Remember, his priority, God first. His passion, continue seeking the Lord and having your mind renewed. His, where are we at? His practice, you just keep going. You don't change. And in this case, and we'll, we have to end, he made that covenant, that perpetual promise with God. So these last three when we talk about piety, uh, that's, that's, I put that there because it says his heart was tender. The, the writer tells us that his heart was tender. When we look at uh, the demonstration of that is found in, uh, in verse 19, that he rent his clothes when he heard the words. And then he, he sought after uh, a, a complete and clear explanation to the, uh, to the prophetess, the one that would be able to explain these things to him. Respond to God's word with a tender heart. That's so important to us. Seek the help of spiritual leaders. He, I think he understood it, but he wanted confirmation. He wanted affirmation. Allow God to observe and to reward your piety. 
Remember what Jesus said when you pray, pray not as the, the publicans that are in the streets and they like to be heard for all the things that they say and they make long, elaborate prayers that everybody can ooh and ah and be impressed. Josiah, a very quiet man, man with a humble heart, a tender spirit, was rewarded verbally from God through the prophetess when she sent the messenger back to him. Nobody else would know this because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself. God saw the humility of his heart and God would honor and recognize that and made sure that Josiah received that reward. Allow God to reward your piety. We can be seen in prayer time we, we can indicate honestly and truthfully that uh, we, we do keep people in mind for prayer, et cetera, et cetera. But there's, there, I, I believe that we have to put limits to that. That if piety is the practice, in other words, humbleness and prayer and, and uh, petitions and so forth and so forth, reading, Bible study, devotion, if that is our life, it need not to be broadcast. And that's part of what Jesus meant when he said, when you pray, do not pray this way. When you have your private time with God, do not be as the publicans are who like to be seen. Josiah didn't want to be seen. And he, God honored that because your heart was tender and because it was humble, because I saw you rend your clothes. And all of that, you will not see the evil. That was his reward for his piety. And might God reward each one of us. And, and with, first off, the lessons, just having the priority of, of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and the love for God, and then a, a passion for the things of the Lord that shows itself in what we do to clean up our life and to, to restore the things that maybe have fallen off, and then to have a continual, humble, tender heart. That is the definition of piety, that continual humbled heart in the presence of God. And when we see the word and it speaks to us, that there may be the occasions, figuratively speaking, we rend our clothes. So, Father, guide us, walk with us, give us a, a, a journey in this life whereby, in the end, you, you are well pleased and, uh, and you can help us and, and direct our steps. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.